have faith that everything can change. My mind is always making things. It's the way that I process my life. If a symphony orchestra was created right now, what would that sound like? We're going to play it one night only at Carnegie Hall. Uh, thank you for being here. He scored the, your uh, documentary from a few years ago, The First Wave, did the music for that. Did this grow out of your relationship with him and conversations with him uh, back in that time? Through a friend, Nick Bertel, I asked him to score this documentary I made, The First Wave. Um, but it was a very like working relationship. Like we didn't like hang out, or we didn't, you know, really know each other that well. And and so we were like, we should probably have dinner. And so we had dinner. He sort of was telling me about American Symphony and his plans, and, and we both sort of turned to each other and we're like, yeah, we should probably probably film this. And at that point, it was a totally different conception. It was going to be this sort of process film, um, as he sort of drove around the U.S., gaining different musical influences to help um, put together this. Um, symphony, but then you know, life intervened. He got nominated for eleven Grammys. She got re-diagnosed with cancer, and so basically, as we were beginning shooting, everything had already shifted completely. I think of um, cases in which people would probably want some of the most private moments. They would like sue to keep them out of a documentary. Um, was it? Uh, were there any rules? Did they have rights to that, or was it sort of a, a very organic relationship that was built over? Um, the course of the production. Yeah, well, I think with any documentary, the foundation is built in trust and they really trust it met. And I think that they trusted each other and they operate with a sense of such radical vulnerability and knowing the importance of sharing their story and what that means for people to allow themselves to be witnessed, right? And like the thing that I say about Matt, which really drew me to his work in this project is that he really bears witness to all moments of life, a lot of difficult moments, but he really bears witness to the very nuanced term of bravery in people, whether it's people on the front lines of a war or in a hospital room. And I think them knowing that about Matt, they just were down for the journey, right? And I think that it's difficult to let people shoot you at your most vulnerable, but you have to have a level of trust, like human to human trust that like my life is in this person's hands and they're going to do right by me. And that was always present. You know, Lauren mentioned your, your work in previous documentaries on battlefields and front lines and in um, war zones. People have referred to this as sort of a gear shift for you, but uh, do you think of it that way? I mean, um, there, to me, it, it feels much like your other work, it just happens to be about John Baptiste. To me, it's the same process. I'm drawn to, you know, fascinating people on some sort of journey, overcoming some sort of obstacle. I mean, that's all my docs have had some element of that, whether it's, you know, cartels in Mexico, ISIS in Syria, end of the war in Afghanistan, whatever it is. It's, you know, I, I, I like, I'm drawn to people who are trying to overcome something that is often insurmountable. You know, my goal is to get as, as deep and intimate to their souls, to their beings, to who they were as, as possible. And to be able to be with artists who are surviving, as they say in the movie, with through their art during this incredibly difficult moment in their life was an unbelievable thing to witness um, and a really inspiring thing to witness. Um, but certainly when we started, we had no idea whether she like it was going to survive. We had no idea what was going to happen. And in fact, she was quite reticent about being part of the film in the early days because she did not want to be, you know, the sick antidote to John's success. Um, and so she, yeah, took a lot of sort of trust building and, 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 and conversations, transparent conversations about my intentions, our intentions um, to get to make her feel comfortable um, to, to get into that hospital. Amazing. Um, uh, Lauren, I wanted to ask about sort of the logistics. It is a double biography. We do learn a lot about her um, and uh, her as an artist and as a writer, uh, but that meant sort of making sure that there was a camera on her a lot. Uh, do, do, how, what was it like just juggling all that? I know so much footage was was filmed. Yeah, so... 
to know Matt know is to know that he believes in the power of Verite filmmaking and a camera is rolling at all times. So we had like 1,500 hours of footage when I came in for the edit. Uh, and we had to sit through that footage and figure out how we make a film. And I know that this is a thing that a lot of filmmakers say, of like, I could have made 11 different films. But when you have that much footage, we really could have made several different films that showed several different facets of their lives. Uh, but a big decision that we made in the edit of like to hold both of them at the same time, to hold the story like this film, we talk so much about balance of how in life we're all constantly holding like a lot of grief and a lot of joy. We're all holding it in this room right now. And how do we measure that balance within the edit? So it's like we couldn't tell the story of his his joy and only her sorrow, right? We needed to explore her joy too, her experience of painting, right? The power of creativity that both of them are using to navigate uh, the joy and the sorrow. And I hope that that's a lesson that viewers will take with them. I think especially in this time that we're in, in this moment in the world, we're all holding so much. And I hope a lot of people find, you know, creative ways to channel that, to make it through as they do in the film. And Lauren, do you want to maybe, as we finish up, talk about the challenge uh, of uh, Carnegie Hall, where there were 13 cameras, um, and and you, I think you were there more than once, right? Uh, or was it just the one time? Just the one time. So when John was initially supposed to perform, he got COVID uh, the night before, the afternoon before that performance? Um, day before. Yeah. yeah. Um, so everything was rescheduled, but again, all the threads that we could pull for this that didn't make it into this film. But yeah, so we had a 13 camera crew. And of course, as you see in the film, the power goes out. Uh, and John just being like a visionary and like musical genius, like obviously handled it with ease. But if you, someone asked recently at a Q and A if that was real. And I was like, oh, if there is a camera in the like camera setup, camera station where you see us freaking out. Cause for us, it's like when you're in the moment you're not thinking of how cinematic this will be. You're like, holy crap, <laughs> this is the moment that we've been gearing up to shoot and now we're not going to have sound. What's happening? Um, and then we just see his grace and again, him being a channel and being able to be like, you know, thank God we had so many cameras so you can see him for like a second, be like, oh, and then be handle it. But yeah, it was really... It was truly the most stressful shoot in my uh, in my career. It was like the power's out, but like the lights are on, and like, does the audience know? And the reality was the power to the stage was out. Um, so like all the recording devices weren't working, all the electronics that John had been using weren't working, um, and so we knew that pretty quickly. And the only reason we had that scene is obviously our cameras were working, but you know instead of using the hundred different mics that were set up for to record because John was recording for an album too. Um, you know, the only audio for that moment when he when he riffed was a shotgun on the steady cam. Um, and that's like what we relied on there. So I wanted to just uh, um finish by actually talking about the end of the film. You know, I always love how you begin and end. You start in this snowy scene where he's laying a little log down to cross a a, a stream and then we end kind of in the same place but in a much different place. It's still the, the snow. They're together. Um, what, uh, what is it saying about them as a couple? The beautiful thing about that moment is that it allows us to interpret as an audience member what's happening. And it's based on like your own personal connection to cancer, to survivor, to art, right? So I look at that moment and I feel just because of my personal connection to these themes that they're looking forward to an uncertain future. And that helps me feel very seen and like navigate my own feelings around those themes in my own life of like, you can look forward with optimism to a future that is deeply uncertain of what lies ahead. And we're like five days late to deliver the film to Telluride where, where the film premiered and just didn't, for me, we had ended the film for months at Carnegie Hall. He did this amazing encore, a rendition of the national anthem that was really beautiful and poignant and tied into the sort of grander themes of the film. But it just didn't feel to me the story we were telling, which at its core is, this, to me, this love story. For me, 
docs can often be really reductionistic in in sort of hand you know spoon feeding you what to feel or to think, and that's you know I love allowing audiences to interpret many you know the the complex grayness of life, um, and so it's not a sort of them walking off into the sunset moment to me. It's them just continuing to walk forward. Have John and Selika seen it with an audience? She asked specifically that she wanted to watch the film alone for the first time. She didn't remember most of what you see in the film because of all the cancer drugs and painkillers that she was on. So it was incredibly emotional for her to watch it. Um, And she had to watch it a few times just to sort of like process the trauma of all that she'd she'd been through. Um, But yeah, I think, you know, Seeing, for them, seeing an audience was just really, um, I think, it touched them a lot to see people react and laugh and cry. And I don't know what the energy in this room was, but there, you know, there was, at, when we premiered at Telluride, just, there's a real special energy in that room. I think they, it, it meant a lot to them. Yeah. And I think both of them have had the experience after screenings of people in the audience coming up to them and telling them, you know, wow, I'm going to look at my life differently or I've been impacted by cancer. And, I've not really I've blocked it out and I've not thought about it. And this is like bringing up a lot of like raw emotions and allowing people to process. Um, so yeah, they, they hold a lot of space. They create a really safe container when they're at screenings. But yeah, it's been really a really beautiful reception. Congratulations again on this beautiful film. And thank you both so much for coming with us tonight. Thank you all for coming out thank tonight you. and spending it with us.